You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello, welcome to the Animal Party with Deborah Wolf. I'm here on Pet Life Radio once again, and today I have a very special guest, Diane Jancy, and she's going to come on and set the record straight about a couple of topics, including service dogs. You might not think that's a controversial topic, but actually, she can explain to you the do's and don'ts of what you need to know about all that. And we're also going to talk about nutrition, teeth cleaning, which is more important than you might think, probiotics, very hot new word. Are you getting it in your yogurt? Is your dog getting it? Does your dog need it? What's that all about? Why are we talking about probiotics when we're talking about animals? So we're going to cover some of those topics. And if you've ever struggled to clean your dog's teeth and given up, then this show's for you because we're going to go through how you can clean your dog's teeth. That's our how-to trick of the day. It's really important. Heart disease, all kinds of stuff happens if you don't clean your dog's teeth. It's not just bad breath, but we'll talk about that too. So we're going to talk about some of these topics, and we're also going to stray into a little bit of a controversial topic. I know it's a party, and it's supposed to be small talk only at parties, but not at my parties. At this party, we're going to tackle the issue of docking and cropping and whether it should be done or shouldn't be done, and what Diane thinks, because Diane's an expert and a breeder. She's shown dogs. She's championed them. And she's also been an AKC CGC evaluator. So at the end of the show, we'll hear from her what exactly it takes to make a really good service dog. That's what we'll hear later. And what is that test? Do you think your dog might want to visit hospitals? Is he really that type of dog? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, you'll find out when she gives you the test. So... Come back right after these sponsors. They're the ones who make this party possible. So listen to the sponsors and come right back to the animal party after these messages. Don't go anywhere, because the best is yet to come. Stick around. Pawfume Dog Grooming and Finishing Spray is proud to be a new sponsor of Pet Life Radio. Pawfume Super Long Lasting Sprays are available in four unique fragrances. Each Pawfume spray is fortified with the finest conditioners and detanglers to make combing out your dog more fun. Pawfume retails for only $2 per 6 ounce bottle. Pawfume is available nationwide at all Dollar General and Family Dollar stores. Why pay more to have your dog smell great? Pawfume, P-A-W-F-U-M-E. It's time for school for you and your friends, your furry best friends. Train your dog the fun and easy way with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Teacher's Pet host, Pia Silvani, teaches you step-by-step how to train your dog the fun and easy way. You get eight 30-minute live audio training sessions, complete transcripts of each session, plus a basic training manual to get you and your dog off to a great start. Training begins the moment you bring your dog home. Teacher's Pet Sessions offers positive reinforcement training to shape your dog's behavior and encourages upbeat, enthusiastic responses to ensure that your dog will enjoy learning. Teacher's Pet Sessions dog training is fun at both ends of the leash. So listen, learn, and laugh with your dog with Teacher's Pet Sessions. Get your copy of Teacher's Pet Sessions Volume 1 today. To order, go to TeachersPetSessions.com. Hi, this is Pia Salvani, your host. Bring your dog, tug toy, and treats, and get ready to have some fun. TeachersPetSessions.com. Got questions about your hound's health? Need the facts on Fido's fitness or food? You want to unleash your pup's potential? Well, you've come to the right place with Win With Dogs. Here, we learn how easy it is to naturally improve the lives of our furry friends. So sit, stay, and get ready to win with dogs. With me, Raquel Wynn. Exercise, nutrition, interaction, and love make for one healthy, happy hound. Give yourself the gift of knowledge on demand every week right here at Pet Life Radio with me, Raquel Wynn, and Win with Dogs. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. You're, you're, you're in 
inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Welcome back to the Animal Party with Deborah Wolf. We're here with Diane Jancy. And welcome to the show, Diane. Well, welcome to everyone out there. And to <laughs> you. It's good to have you on finally. So I want to ask you, why is teeth cleaning so important, Diane? Oh, this is one of my hot topics. It's something that every person that comes to me that needs help, whether they're a pet, have uh, breeding dogs, or they show their dogs, uh, is something that I teach them from the very beginning on how to start with your puppy. But if you haven't done it, you got to start with an adult dog. Uh, and it is very important because... Every time your dog takes a breath, the bacteria that is on those teeth uh, that is put on there by the saliva and the food and the dog hair all stuck together almost like a muddy swallow's nest, all that bacteria literally goes down into the intestines with every swallow, goes through the lungs with every breath that the dog takes when he's running with his mouth open, and can lead to all kinds of diseases and an impaired immune system because the body of the dog has to constantly work against all that load of bad bacteria, especially for people. Their dog is fine, and then every two weeks they have a whoops on their living room floor, and a lot of the times it's caused from the lack of digestion and an overload of bacteria. Are you saying the dog, you mean he has an accident or he vomits? I'm not sure what you're saying. He oh, I'm this. sorry. He has a good case of <laughs> diarrhea. Oh, okay. So, He's diarrhea. So you yeah. mean a chronic diarrhea that has no cause can sometimes be caused by bad dental hygiene? Sure. And we, and we have the vets using lots of buzzwords for us to understand that irritable bowel syndrome. It could be one of the leading causes for this disease along with some autoimmune diseases that we're seeing in our dogs more than ever before. So, well, I know you've been working in canine nutrition and uh, as a canine dental hygienist for 30 years, so you know what you're talking about, so I want people to listen to you. You've also bred dogs, owned dogs, handled them to championships, so really done well in the show ring, and you've been a 4-H judge. So if people think, oh, come on, I'm not going to brush my dog's teeth. Okay, well, think of just the human. You know, we know now that when a woman's pregnant, she's not supposed to let her teeth get really bad because she'll have her baby too early. Or when a man has heart disease or heart problems, he has to really keep his teeth clean and go regularly to the dentist or he's going to have more heart problems. So our dogs, I mean, that's people who are brushing their teeth twice a day and going maybe once or twice a year to the dentist and flossing. Our dogs, most of them, if we're not doing it, it's not happening at all, right? Well, and that's exactly right. And we can start with the very simplest thing and bad breath. And, you know, here's our, our pets. Many of our pets live indoors with us. Um, I don't know about a lot of your listeners, but I'll bet a lot of them sleep in bed with them. And, so, mm -hmm. and you know, kiss, kiss on the face, mouth-to-mouth -mouth kissing, a lot of that going on here. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, the odor can be, you know, pretty, pretty tough. And so, yes, if you have a puppy... You're, you're going to have to handle that puppy's mouth to make it a very social dog anyway. So it's a perfect time to start with brushing, especially when they're teething and changing out their teeth. It makes it easier for them. You know, having a group of breeding dogs and show dogs here, and I, I have uh, a father dog and a mother dog with puppies. And what, literally kind, the, what kind of breed are you oh, breeding? Bichon Frise. Okay. Little white Is it true? Thing. Are your little Bichon Frises, they look like kind of stretched out poodles. Are they, so many people I know with Bichon Frises have piddle problems. Now, is this something that's just part of the makeup of the breed, or is it all about how you get overly excited when you greet them? What's going on there? Why are so oh, many Bichons? Ab absolutely not. I have, I have uh, four stud dogs in the house. I have, I have four uh, females in the house at all different ages. And it is, it's just not allowed for them to lift their leg uh, or to go to the bathroom in the house. You know, you have exceptions if a dog's immune system becomes compromised and they become sick with something. Okay, right. you know, everybody's going to make a mistake. But mm -hmm. on a daily basis, and you think about it, I have eight dogs. No. The, the key to success with Bichon's is one, 
especially because I know I hear this from a lot of people, and it's even on websites from other breeders, which is shocking I know, to me. I know. And multi, because, multi-poos, Maltese, toy poodles, it's really a common problem, but I see that it's a common problem in the way that people greet the dog. That's what I see. They have this dog so overly excited at greetings, and they don't teach it properly when it's a puppy, so it thinks peeing is part of the greeting. It really thinks that's the way to greet people. And well, it's I so think, easy to I think, there, I think there's a level of submission there. Where Absolutely. A dog, where Absolutely. a dog hasn't allowed to bring their stature up as they're growing. And yes, yes. And the over-the-top greeting, over-the-top, big, 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 big. And the dog is habituated to this submissive hello that it learned, you know, seemed to appease. So what do you tell people? If they've got a Bichon right now that wets the carpet every time company comes over, right now, what should they do? The first thing they need to do, it's, it's not a quick fix. First thing okay. they need to do is walk the dog a whole lot more than right. they are. It can, and secondly, if you know you have company coming over, you know, you go put your pie in the oven for dinner and then you grab a leash and you take your pup out for a good walk where the puppy is uh, or the adult dog is emptied. They'll just let them out in the backyard. They need a walk. They need right. They need or go with exercise. them in the backyard at least. Entertain right. them out there if that's your choice. But be with them, right? Be right. with them be and with make sure them. they're actually peeing and doing the thing that you want them and to do. So they're tired when the company comes and they're empty. I heard you say the word empty. Okay, then what do they do if the dog, because he's been doing it every day, every day, maybe he's four years old, he thinks this is just the way it's done. So even though he should be empty, maybe he tries to force out a little bit because the people come in and they're, hi, puppy, hi, puppy. Okay, so what do they do now? They've got him empty. They've got him calm. Should they well, step actually, outside with the actually, puppy? Actually, 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 I think what you're dealing with in, in a dog that pees upon greeting, I mean, my dogs, we scream and yell and greet everybody. I don't have anybody peeing. Right, okay. But if I have a guest dog that is not social, is more of a submissive person because the people have been so hard on them or not help them to grow up by experiencing things and have, um, you know, their brain engaged in something else. Uh, and I see that problem. Then if I know people are coming, we greet outside. So at least then the habit he's got or she's got isn't you can get her to understand, you know, if she pees outside, you don't fuss over it, you don't pay attention, you don't scold it. But I think you need to work on something else, right? Some other way of greeting, like, is there something, I mean, with most dogs, if they're doing something negative at the door, I would teach them to bring a ball or to sit or something positive to do when they want to greet. Is that something you could do with the Bichon? Well, you can do that, but I, I think any dog peeing, you've, you've got several issues more than than what you're just saying, trained and greeting at the door. You you have different levels of age, okay? And a young right. puppy is more than likely to, to piddle. But, you know, I, I have puppies growing up at all ages, and real frankly, we just don't have any of that. But I take my dogs out, and they greet people on the street, and they greet other dogs, and we take them down to the beach, and we get them on boats, and we take them near the water, and we... You know, there, it's just an on-ending type thing. But when you have a puppy that does that, it's just like with any child, real frankly, I ignore bad behavior and I reward good behavior. So okay. if there is a piddle, then I turn my back to the dog and they learn real quick that they're not being accepted. Um, and that's the simplest thing. Bichons are really, really smart dogs. But some of the other piddle problems are uh, the quality of food they're feeding, creates right. bladder urgency. They could have a lot of yeast in their system, which creates bladder urgency. You know they what? Let's have... go for a commercial break, and when we come back to the party, we'll talk about some nutrition. All right? So thanks. All Hang right. in there, Diane. We'll be back in a minute. Everybody grab a drink, refresh your hors d'oeuvres. We'll be back to the party. Let's just get a word from our sponsors. Don't leave this party before it's over because the best is yet to come. Only losers leave the party early anyway. Party on. Back in a few. Give your dog some thought. With Dog Thoughts, it's the iPhone application that everyone's talking about. Hey, what do you think of this? A man in Davis, California says he's invented an application for the iPhone that claims it can read your dog's mind. Huh? No, it's true. I read about it on my cat's Twitter page. That's why. 
Jay Leno talked about it, CBS reported on it, and now you can see what all the buzz is about. Created just for dog lovers, Dog Thoughts makes taking photos of your furry best friend more fun. Shake your dog and read his mind. <gasps> on your iPhone, of course. Take a pic of your pup, shake your phone, and watch as his thoughts appear on the screen. Does he have a bone to pick with you, or is he having a tail-wagging day? Get your Dog Thoughts iPhone app today. Just 99 cents. Go to PetLifeRadioPromotions.com. That's PetLifeRadioPromotions.com. This valuable information comes from your pet. There's nothing like a wagging tail or friendly paw to lift your mood. They're therapeutic and make us feel good. Studies show pets even reduce stress, prevent heart disease, lower blood pressure, and fight depression. So there you have it. Pets are a daily dose of good health and happiness. Pets add life. To learn more, visit petsaddlife.org. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Hi, this is Marcy Davis and my service dog, Whistle, and we're your hosts of Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Working Like Dogs is the show where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about working animals or working dogs. Whether you're a member of a working dog team or you've just seen a working dog or animal out at the mall or the grocery store, and you're curious about how these amazing animals work with their human partners, then Working Like Dogs is the show for you. Join us for the inside scoop at Working Like Dogs on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. You're, you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Welcome back to the party. We're here with Diane Jancy, and she's a canine nutritionist, and she's also a dental hygienist for dogs, and she's been breeding and working with dogs for over 30 years. She's been an evaluator, a judge, all kinds of things. She's here sharing her expertise with us, and we're about to ask her about nutrition. So let's, let's hear your take on this, Diane. How important is what we feed our dogs? Well, it's uh, extremely important to get good quality food into your dog. And there are good companies that have made uh, convenience foods for us in the form of kibble. Uh, I don't believe personally that there is such a thing as complete nutrition. Um, I believe that nutrition is your consumption of everything you eat within a period of a month. I do know that dogs can only digest what they ate the day before. And it's pretty much the same with humans. If you eat a heavy steak meal one day, then the next morning you're eating fish, you go, I just can't believe this. I'm so hungry. Well, sure, mm-hmm. because you've produced more digestive uh, juices and your body's saying, where's that steak? That's what I want to be digesting today. So there's a couple of factors in feeding. One is continuity and one is consistency, and also one is giving your dog things that you can treat the dog without throwing the balance out. 
So would that be um, healthy, sensible treats, alternative treats, or would it be the actual food taken out of the meal and put in a Ziploc bag? Like, what are you talking about, treats? Everybody well, wants like, to give their dog treats. Treats. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. You and I can sit there and we're watching our weight, so you and I can both eat every vegetable we find in the refrigerator, and we'll probably be in pretty good shape, and it's not considered getting us out of balance. Right. And there are vegetables that dogs like to eat. They like the mini carrots or the bigger carrots. It's, it's a reward treat. There is a high sugar in it, but it's good for them occasionally. I think they like yams and they like apples. A lot of dogs, not all, sure. but a lot of dogs. Some dogs and even it, like mangoes. And mango is exceptionally good for them because of the digestive enzymes that are in that food. And oh, so, and we just had Halloween. Pumpkin is a big, big hit with dogs. Now, pumpkin is my favorite, especially for all of you people out there that have dogs that have a corkscrew tail. And the reason I'm saying this is, is the an- anatomy of a dog with a corkscrew tail. Generally, they have a deep stomach gut, and they have to move the food up, back up high towards the hip, over a haunch and out, which is different than your sporting dogs and some other mm-hmm. breeds. And the consequence of that is the dog can get constipated. And so pumpkin, and and let's not mistake it for pumpkin pie filling, but you can go to the grocery store and get a can of pure pumpkin, and then depending upon the size of your breed, like if you have a a Boston, uh, you can use a teaspoon of pumpkin lasting at night. If you have an English bulldog, you can use you know, one to two tablespoons at night in their bowl, the last thing they eat, and they just love it. And it will actually take the moisture that's in the pumpkin and it will neutralize, it will reset up the intestines and take a lot of stress off the dog uh, from having constipation. And consequently, too, if your dog has diarrhea, you can feed pumpkin any time you have diarrhea because the fiber will absorb the bad toxins that are in the intestine and oh. help to normalize the poo. So while that argument's gone on for years, uh, would well, you feed it for constipation or do you feed it for diarrhea? The only Gross. difference is feed it for constipation at night before bed and for diarrhea, feed it whenever the dog has it. Well, and I would also say if you're new at this, if you've never given your dog pumpkin and he does have a problem, he's got diarrhea, (laughs) maybe go easy and see because some dogs are sensitive. Like, you know, just because the 60-pound dog next door has a half a cup every night doesn't mean your 60-pound dog needs a half a cup every night. So if your recommendation is for a half a cup, you might want to start with a quarter just to make sure it doesn't go right through him and you've got an accident in the morning because I think it's a little bit sensitive just like with people. You got to get the amounts right, wouldn't you say? Well, uh, yes, of course. And it, it's when you sit there, and if you if you look at it, pretty much on the internet, you can find out the directions for this. Under a twenty pound dog is one to two teaspoons. Okay. A twenty to fifty pound dog is one to two tablespoons. Okay. A fifty to a hundred pound dog is two to five tablespoons, and you can always start slow on anything and give the dog time to figure out what it is it's doing with this food. You touched on this just a minute ago when you talk about corkscrew dogs and that their bodies are basically built differently so it's harder for them to process food. This is the kind of thing that has led to some changes in the UK where breeders are being really forced by the head organization because it's built differently than the American equivalent, but they're being forced to to set down new rules and comply with new rules and standards that will make the dogs not only look good, but the look has to also be functional. So if a look is not healthy for the dog or makes it harder for the dog to digest or makes it impossible for the dog to give birth naturally, needs C-sections, then that standard might be changed so that only, only certain looks that are also healthy and also functional are allowed to continue. And that kind of touches on a topic we talked about once about docking and cropping. Because I know that there's places like in Canada, there's a whole province where the veterinarians are no longer allowed to do elective surgeries. No docking, no cropping, no cat decline. 
and um, it's New Brunswick. And so if they do it, they lose their license. They lose their insurance. They can't do it. Now, probably what's happening is breeders who want it done are just you know, taking their dogs in their car and driving to the next province or, or even getting on a boat and going to Maine or, you know, Boston or something. But what do you think about all this? Because this is your world, right? You're an expert in the middle of this world. So could, would you mind sharing your opinion on this? Well, sure. There's, there's a lot of changes going on. And, you know, sometimes you have to go with change and, and sometimes you need to stand up and say, hey, I can appreciate this, but it's really not in the best interest of, of a particular breed. Um, English Springer Spaniels have uh, naturally an extremely long tail, uh, and so do Old English Sheepdogs. Well, you all, if, let's say you have one as a pet in your house, mm-hmm. and that tail goes flying. You're not using it out in the field. You're not using it to herd sheep, and that tail is happy to see you. Well, it's <laughs> interesting enough, that tail can whack you hard enough to leave you brutally bruised. It can also knock things off your coffee table. And so you literally have to dog-proof the house to keep that particular dog. My concern is the reason some of these events were originally done was actually for the safety of the owners and Mm -hmm. also for the safety of the dog. Well, there are certain breeds, like certain Rottweilers I've known, and not all of them, but certain ones, if their tail isn't docked, if it's left natural, it will break open just by bashing against the wall or the fridge or whatever. Break open, break open, break open. And these people are, eventually they get the dog tail docked as the dog is an adult. It's a much more serious operation, but they just can't afford or want to deal with more and more surgeries because every time it breaks open they got to go back for stitches and so that becomes a problem but it's not in all dogs i've seen a lot of standard poodles with non-doc tails recently and their tails are light and they curl up over the top of their back like a little husky and they're there's nothing you know objectionable about it it wouldn't hurt you it wouldn't hit you it wouldn't knock you you know it's a it's a lovely tail so i guess in a way it's kind of breed specific isn't it well, it, and that's the whole point. Um, it would be very breed specific, and yet, even with that lovely, loose looking tail, uh, one of the problems you have, and it's similar to the ones we, we uh, have with Bichons, which have a full tail over the back. Right. Well, it takes me more time to demat where that tail lays on the dog hair. <laughs> <laughs> and it does the rest of the dog. Right. Yeah. So I imagine with poodles, it's pretty much the same thing with that particular coat. Is that that constant? You know what? I've ne- the- I must confess, the only ones I've seen are standards, and so no, it's really not a big deal at all. They sort of shave yeah. most of the tail anyway, and you don't hardly notice it. But um, but no, I'm not. I'm not talking about toys. I think everybody with a toy docks it. So that's interesting. Maybe that's why. Okay, so let's move on to. Um, I know I promised them a how to. So how do you, if you don't have a puppy anymore who's just, you know, limp in your lap? Well, if you did, let's do that first. If you have a puppy, limp in your lap, loves everything, loves chewing on everything, loves having your fingers in its mouth. Okay, how do we begin teeth cleaning with that? And then I'll ask you, okay, what about the dog who says, hell no, <laughs> I don't want my teeth cleaned. And that tastes terrible. So we'll start with the easygoing puppy. Well, with a baby puppy, of course, the best thing to do is get your hands in the mouth. And I know everybody doesn't want to put their hands in the mouth of any dog, puppy or otherwise, but it's in your best interest for a secure dog later on to be well handled in the mouth between the gum and the lip. And so you can start real simply with um, just letting him lick a little peanut butter off your finger. Then uh, many uh, companies make, um, it's like a a little rubber piece that fits over your finger and and one end of it has very tiny soft bristles. You know what, I'll just fill in here, it almost looks like the kind of thing a secretary would use when she's flipping through papers and she wants to grip it. It's almost like a rubber thimble. Okay. Right, like a rubber (laughs) thimble. That's a good way of explaining it. I'm going to use that if you don't mind. (laughs) No problem. And, And so... You can start by loading that rubber thimble then is the second exercise with the same peanut butter you use to let them lick off the finger. But this time, go to the back on either side. And real frankly, it's easier if you start training your dog with toothbrush on the top of the dog's mouth than the bottom. And then start learning, you know, different holds on how to keep your puppy from wiggling, uh, even if you have to have somebody else hold the puppy while you do that. But use that soft little brush 
uh, to go around the gums and the teeth and get them used to it while you use a nice, high, praising voice. Like, this is a really good time, and don't you like the peanut butter? Now, frankly, after that, you can start using the poultry-flavored enzymatic toothpastes that we have, and then you're, you're already brushing teeth, and that's a mm-hmm. great thing. And once you move from the top, then you can start on the bottom jawline. Don't, you, don't go directly to the teeth. Just as the jaw opens, the um, flap of the jaw opens up that skin, just roll your finger down to the lower gum line of the dog, and instead of trying to brush the top of the teeth, which signals them to eat, in other words, munch, munch. That includes your clamp. finger. Yeah, they'll bite. Yeah. They'll close. They'll, they'll <laughs> clamp down. You're going to want to use a motion of going up, like feathering up. And then when it comes to the point of going doing the front of the teeth, you take your index finger, and this is only if you're training a puppy. Okay. Do not start this with an adult dog if you would like to keep your finger. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay, you take your thumb on the lower part of the, underneath of the jaw, your index finger goes in between, right behind the canine teeth, and your top finger goes as a little pressure over the top of the nose, and then your other hand is being used to brush those six front teeth and then the longer canines, and before you know it, and you're not trying to brush like you would brush your own teeth, right. when you start... If this takes five seconds on the top and five seconds on the bottom to start with, you've done great. And, work and lots yourself. of good dog, good dog, you're a good boy. Make sure he's happy and positive and you're not stressed out. Right, and giggling, and don't you get frustrated because you don't have to sit there and clean every tooth every single time until your dog, and, and very seriously, most dogs that I know who are trained well for toothbrushing will frankly hit the bathroom uh, where you brush your teeth long before you get there to brush your teeth and will patiently sit and wait for theirs to be done. Yeah, they and actually like it once they get used to it. They, 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 do like they act it. like they're getting a massage. They actually enjoy it. So, okay, so now if we don't have a puppy, that's the way to start with a puppy. What if you don't have a puppy and should you use toothbrushes? Is there such a thing, you know, and there's so many products sold out there where they show you the commercial and it's like, uh, he thinks he's chewing a bone, but really he's brushing his teeth. But he's not, most, is he? Most of them don't work. In fact, uh, this is something, too. The enamel of a dog's teeth was made to last for 15 years. The enamel for our teeth was made to last for 70. So that means the enamel of a dog's teeth are not as not as strong as ours. Okay. And if you're not getting the teeth professionally cleaned, and this is something else that I'll, I'll bring in real quick, that puppies, you know, once a year, up until about three, four, five years of age, depending upon the foods you feed, as, as they get older, you must have them professionally clean more often to the point that at 10 years of age, you're doing it once a quarter uh, in order to keep the teeth in the mouth without any problems. Um, and there's many ways you can do it. You can have them uh, scaled by somebody that uh, scales without anesthesia. Um, there's plenty of veterinarians, and with today's, products that are used to put a dog to sleep, they're safe. And it's not like long ago, take your 10, 11, 12-year-old dog, put him to sleep, and you may not see him ever again. But right. with your veterinarian's uh, work up on your dog, and he knows your dog, he knows exactly what you can do. It's usually a very mild sedative that they use. And then to have the vet you know, professionally uh, get those teeth really clean, and you have the health of your dog, and frankly, it will keep the dog's disease level so far down for having clean teeth that you'll spend less on the lifetime of your dog than the total amount of teeth cleanings that you spend to have done. Okay, so so if they've got a dog that they haven't been doing this with and they wish they had, now they're feeling guilty and they're thinking, all right, all right, I'll I'll try this. Maybe they have some. They might even have some of that canine toothpaste sitting in their cupboard that they never used. Okay, so what do they do? How do they get their dog who's just an average dog, okay, not super aggressive, but he just doesn't know what's coming. He may may not participate fully. How do you get him to want to sit there and let you do this? 
And what do you do? Well, okay, the first thing you want to do is, is enclose them in a small room. Okay? okay. So the bathroom, close the door. The second thing, you want to have some fresh water. And then you want to talk to your dog about this beforehand. Now, you're going to look real silly, but uh, when I go into a dog I've never seen before, and I'm going to use standard poodles, and for all you people that own standard poodles, what a special animal and breed that is. <laughs> oh, uh, see, I breed standard poodles, so you, you oh, struck okay. me yeah. now. Okay, it's, thank it's, you. It's, it's my favorite breed for doing, I, if I could do nothing You're but very clean, tolerant. They're very, they're very, um, yeah, they're very bright, and they know that you're doing it for their own good, and they stand there and take it. And I mean, they're really tolerant. But okay, <laughs> and then you've got the English bulldog. So you know, the the first thing you have to do is make sure your dog is mouth safe, and you do this by sitting down at the level eye level of the dog, so you're not overpowering them, and you want to handle the muzzle, and you want to see if you can lift that lip. And lift the lip, give the dog a treat. Lift the other side of the lip, give the dog a treat. Tell him, good boy. Pat his chest. Look him in the eye, tell him how good he is. And then explain to him that you've got a new thing going on. Now, (laughs) this time when you lift the lip, you're going to have doggy, poultry-flavored, beef-flavored, whatever you're using, enzymatic toothpaste. And look for that. Look for the enzymes. And you're going to have it on your fingers. And remember, you're not going for the teeth at this point. You're going for the gum. Yeah. And okay. then just smear the paste up on the gum, and they're going to lick it, and they're going to lick it and have a good time, and then you're going to say, good dog, and give them a treat. And you may okay. have to do this for a week every okay. morning at the same time so they understand you're going to play with their mouth. You know what? Because of the because there's no stress, no pressure, and there's a good taste, your dog is going to be anticipating this. You're going to find your dog hanging out in the bathroom, hoping right. you're going to come by and brush his teeth. And that's what you want. You want him to like this. Okay. So exactly. then Exactly. Then if you don't have one of those wonderful little rubber toothbrushes that fit on your finger, you can use a washcloth and wrap it around your finger and you can put load it with plenty of doggy toothpaste and start with just one tooth. And the easiest tooth to work with on a dog for brushing is their large, long canine in the front. So okay. if you can hold their, their nose somewhat still and take five seconds and do the top canine on the left, then do the top canine on the right, you're done for that day. And then, good boy, you were wonderful. And then keep that up. And then you can do the front six. Then you can go to the back. And then you can start going to an actual toothbrush. Now, they make doggy toothbrushes, which really, frankly, for hand brushing, the bristle is very soft. And for a new dog, I prefer that. It has two sides. The large side is a large triangle. The small side is a small triangle, obviously, for large dogs and small dogs. And the thing that is important before you use a brand new toothbrush on a dog is they're going to give you a wild eye if you don't (laughs) remember to soak it up pretty good with nice warm water and soften those bristles. And frankly, while you're training the dog, you should wet that bristle uh, every day and rub it with your finger just to soften those bristles up so it's not stiff. And never use a dry brush on a dog's mouth. They will not like it. It must be wet. Load it with plenty of toothpaste. And then, you know, it's a good time to use the washcloth and wipe down the muzzle afterwards because the dog won't do it wrong, but you will. So you're the one that will need to clean up the muzzle (laughs) until you get it, (laughs) until you get that down. So everybody is really happy with the whole process. And remember, train the top teeth first, train the outside of the teeth first, then train the lower jaw next the outside only of the lower jaw then go back to the upper jaw and you're going to have a dog whose mouth you can keep open it may take you three months don't get discouraged do it slow don't have a bad event and then start getting to the inside of the dog's mouth and remember when you start a new area you got to go back to square one fast in a few seconds with lots of praise don't try to do a three-minute brush job at once. It won't happen. Okay. So we've talked about dental hygiene. We've talked a little bit about nutrition, but there's one thing I gave in the intro that we didn't get to. So I just want to ask you quickly about probiotics and dogs. Okay. I see commercials on TV telling me if I eat this yogurt, 
I'll be trimmer and fitter and I'll look great because probiotics will do a number on my digestive tract. But then I see other people on TV, doctors, being interviewed saying that's impossible and the acids in your stomach would destroy anything you ingested and uh, that this is all just anecdotal, that there's no real proof probiotics work. So probiotics in dogs, what's going on here? Because I don't even know what to think in humans. So now I'm oh. faced with in dogs. Okay. Yeah, well, I, I would be happy to challenge any doctor that made a statement like that. He's more than welcome to contact me here in Orange. I'll be <laughs> well, you more see than it all happy the time to help now. him. There's studies yeah. refuting well, it. it. There's studies pro, and and everyone knows that if you you know you go someplace where you're expecting problems, you take acidophilus with you. But does it work? And you know all this kind of stuff. So okay, so dogs too. I mean, dogs who drink out of muddy puddles and eat poo, they're okay, and they but they need they need pro. Like I'm trying to get my head around this. So explain it to me. Educate me, please. Okay. Well, first let's talk about probiotics living in an acidic stomach, since that's where they were found. I mean, probiotics have never been an outside source going to the mouth first. Uh, the first probiotics were identified and understood in the late 1800s with our famous scientist that we know, Louis Pasteur, and then was later reported by Lister in 1878, and they found several strains consistent in the intestinal tract. Well, today we know there's over 500 different strains in the digestive system. And what happens is when you have a stressed dog or a dog that has a course of antibiotics uh, right. okay. or because they've been ill, that a lot of the digestive enzymes and probiotics that are in the stomach are just, they're depleted. And probiotics, when you have a good quality pro probiotic, it's going to colonize in the stomach. So what you want to think about is the stomach looking like uh, downtown Los Angeles with people living on top of people. That's a really great colonized area versus wash-through probiotics, which you can take as an immediate help to get through something, but they're not going to stay around for very long. And it is interesting to note that both are being used in both for humans and for dogs, and it's difficult to decide and understand whether you're getting a wash-through probiotic or mm. a colonizing probiotic. But what you're going to look for when you look on any packaging is, first of all, when you take uh, probiotics, is how old is that packaging? Does it need to be refrigerated? Are they supposed to keep it cold the whole time? There are some that have to be refrigerated, like probiotics and yogurt. Because um, I've, seen, I've seen bottles on the shelf, non-refrigerated, with a stamp on it that says, must be kept cold. <laughs> and I think, well, I'm not going to buy that. That's stale. Well, the refrigerated products, when you go to a whole food a grocery or a holistic thing, generally those are found in the refrigerated right. system. Right. But there's plenty of powders out there that work. The thing you have to know about the powders is the, the usable rate, and they're rated in the millions, millions of CFUs. Like, for instance, okay. uh, lactobacillus acidophilus is the most common. And we see that, and if you just remember the word acidophilus, okay. it basically means it lives in an acid in environment. It will develop in the stomach, and it will say 400 million CFU on the package, which is great. If the package is a month old, then you're going to eliminate 20% of the 400 million, and that's what you probably really have left. And so uh, you just want to get a fresher package if you can. Um, okay. And when you take it, you know, for, for yourself or for a dog, and since we're dealing with dogs, and this is really what we're going for, yeah. if you have a source of pectin to eat with whatever acidophilus uh, you're using, whether it's liquid, whether it's powder, whether it's in yogurt, you want to add fruit. And I mean, if you go to the grocery store, most yogurts have fruit in them, and there's a good reason right. why. That pectin helps to colonize in the stomach. And what does, this, what does uh, probiotics do is they are actually a form of good bacteria that keep in check bad bacteria that you get from eating uh, spoiled foods, 
breathing through your mouth, bad air. Can I ask you, if you've got a dog, let's just go over, like, what symptoms, if your dog had bad breath, maybe, or if he was scratching, if his skin was looking terrible, or, because I'm thinking, how would you know when this is the problem, when you need to start giving him acidophilus and you need to start worrying about his probiotics? Is it when he eats other dogs' poop? Is that a sign? Well, that is definitely a sign, and but part of the probiotic, that's only part of it when we talk about uh, poo eaters. The other, the other part um, that you're looking at is, is digestive enzymes, and so um, that's kind of interesting. Uh, if you want to really solve po- uh, poo eating, you need digestive enzymes also. So, yeah, there are symptoms that will show up uh, that your dog is not doing well and, and it's like poor stool quality. And what that means is okay. um, it can be... Too, too liquid, too hard, right? Too, <laughs> too liquid generally is the case and okay. smelly, you know, very okay. putrid. Okay. Loss of coat. If your yeah. dog's coat just looks terrible. And interesting enough, since we just finished talking about teeth, when you don't have a good balance, you have a much heavier build up quicker of tartar build up on the teeth and mm-hmm. also for all those people out there and you know I have white 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 little bichons and if yes I the brown my, stain what about the brown stain is that part well, of this that could be ye- what we call yeast overgrowth from too which is yeast has to come from a bacteria so too much bad bacteria and you're going to have yeast and it'll eventually show up pink around the tail, pink under the paws, pink coming on the inside flop of the ear, pink Okay, in what the about beard. the brown eye stains? How do people deal with that? Because you breed Bichons, you must have to deal with that. Oh, yeah. None of mine have any brown eye stains unless they've had a issue where they've So a lot of these from- problems that I'm identifying as problems that most, that I often see with Bichons are actually badly bred Bichons is what I'm getting from you because they're not problems you're seeing regularly and I am seeing them in the Bichons that I see. So it's interesting to note. But there are some, if you, if you help your dog with his nutrition and his teeth, everything's going to be better. Not necessarily perfect. And, and there are, I hate to say badly bred Bichons. I think 80% of the stuff can be checked with nutrition and okay. understanding the dynamics of the dog. But you have a situation where, in truth, a dog genetically can actually be missing the connection from its tear duct to the nose, and that is one of the uh, a cause for having uh, tear staining mm-hmm. that can sometimes can be corrected and sometimes cannot. But, but your vet's going to your... catch that one, right? Your vet's going to catch. No, it. no, He's you, not? you, no. He he will probably do what is correct. When um, eye staining comes in, they will first, if the dog is over a year, will want to put it on some sort of tetracycline right. um, or teramycin and see if they can clear it up from a bacteria form. But once they find they can't clear it up and if the owner persists that they want a white-faced dog, then they will do a test. Now, down here in the States, it runs about $150 where they, they numb the eyeball they put a dye on the eyeball and then they take some saline solution with dye and they put it through the tear duct and if the tear duct color of dye comes through the nasal of the dog on the right. tissue, then it's intact. Right. But if it's not intact, then you're going to have an issue. Now, if you have an intact tear duct to the nose and everything's draining properly, but you're still having problems with this overspilling, you could have a blocked tear duct, which then is also a veterinarian procedure to right. unblock that tear duct. Then the next least problematic, but can be the case, is you can have a curled in eyelash that's irritating the eye. And that can be removed easily and checked on regularly to make sure it doesn't reoccur. But then also nutrition, the wrong pH on the dog, too much corn, too much sugar, too many fats will actually thicken the fluid that is in the eye and therefore it's, the fluid will not go down that tiny little tear duct so it will spill over on the eye and then the fur and the normal bacteria on the skin 
will form more bacteria, which will then become yeasty smelling. And as that evaporates back onto the eyeball, then it will re-irritate the eyeball with more tearing. So then you have something that's in a cycle that is going to continually happen. Now, can I mention Oh, boy, no, you're losing me. I don't want to hear this now. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Go quick. Can I mention a product on, on, uh, sure, that might absolutely. help us? Okay. Absolutely, most- but we do have to... We d- the party's coming to an end, so before the party's over... Oh, no! Uh, absolutely, yeah, give it to me now. <laughs> okay, uh, a product which um, I have used on many, many show dogs that has worked successfully is okay. I... I envy, and you can go online, you can look at this product online. Um, I don't get any deals for mentioning it, okay? Okay. (laughs) It's just a product that I happen to like. And the things to know about the product is regardless of what they say, it needs to be refrigerated. If you're going to use the product, use it. I never use the pads, uh, the dry pads to wipe the eye. I just use the liquid on a a 3cc syringe and let it run down the face. Uh, you definitely want to use the powder on the product to dry up so you don't keep re-irritating the eye. It won't hurt if you splash it into the eye, but you have to set aside time to use it three times daily for the first three days okay. or it won't work. And that's something that um, a lot of people don't understand. And it's a product that will just really clear up the eye if you really do not have any other you know, issues other than a recycling acidic type moisture hitting the eyes from the skin and the fur. Diane, we never got to uh, service dogs and how you know if your dog would make a good hospital visitor. So I guess I'll have to have you back sometime and we'll have to cover that then because the party's over. I can see they're packing up the food trays and they're sweeping up the hall and the music's dying down. We've got to go. The party's over. We've, been, we've stayed till the end of the party. You're a party animal, it's aren't you, fun. It's been fun. Thank you so much. <laughs> so where can All people right. find more about you? Have, you? have you got a website? You know, it's under construction. I've been word of mouth for 30 30 years and I usually have more business than I can handle but I can still be found by googling my name and you can find my articles all over the internet and you can go ahead and pull them and read them and they're they're very low key so anybody okay from everybody the pet so that's that's Diane Jancy D-I-A-N-E J-A-N-S-E-Y if you want to google her and find out more or listen to this show because on a future party we'll have her back she was a great party guest thank you very much Diane have a great week thank you Okay, everybody, so we finished the party. We're wrapping it up, but I want to tell you that next week and in the weeks to come, we've got some great guests coming. If you want your animals read, if you want your dog and cat, if you want to know what they're thinking, if you want to ask a question and get the answer, what is my cat thinking? Why does my dog hate my brother? Why won't my cat use the cat scratch post? Whatever your question is, post the question, snap a photo of your pet looking right on camera, eyes showing well, and send it to me because I'm having Tim Link, author of Pet Tales, on in the new year. And he'll be doing readings of the pets that uh, we receive good photographs for. So send it to Debra at PetLifeRadio.com. And thanks to all our sponsors and thanks to Mark for making this show such a great party. Party on, everybody. Till next week, be good with your animals. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.